So here we are, eight years later, we're beating the historical average in job creation, but we're still lagging in incomes rising. And so that explains why there are so many people who are so upset. It also explains why the areas that were already left out and left behind feel more left out and left behind. And insofar as there are small towns and rural areas, not coincidentally, they also have the highest rates of prescription drug and heroin abuse in the United States. So you've got a lot of people who look at that picture and it makes them angry or anxious. You have young people who graduate from college with debt they're not sure they can replay. They can't move out of their parents' house because they can't make the debt payment and pay rent. You've got kids in college who wonder if the same things are going to happen to them. And so the first question is, do you believe, as I do, what the president said? Yeah. I do believe that. Now, if you believe that, then it's okay to feel angry and disenfranchised, but it's a poor way to make a decision. You've got to make a decision based on how we can all rise together. Hillary is running for president to put every American in the picture that was made it in the Every American. To do it, we've got to maximize our opportunities and then tear down the barriers to keep people from participating in them. Here are the basic opportunities. Number one, we can create literally millions of jobs that cannot be moved away from us by making a massive commitment to modernize our infrastructure and become a clean energy supervisor. Even though it's a long way away, I know a lot of you were heart sick when you read about the, blood, the lead levels in the blood of those children in Flint, Michigan. But we now know Flint is by no means the only place in America where children have elevated lead levels in their blood because we have refused to modernize the places we need to modernize. Just think how many jobs it would create and how much good it would do if you ripped up every lead rusty pipe in this country and modernized every child in this country. If we embrace Hillary's moonshot, a half a million solar panels in the next four years, and in eight years, every American home completely powered by clean, sustainable American homes. To the skeptics who say it can't be done, let me just remind you that right now, there are already three states, Minnesota, Iowa, and believe it or not, Texas, that get more than a third of their electricity from the wind. And Iowa has the lowest kilowatt hour cost for electricity in the United States of America because they are committed to a clean energy future and everybody in America can do that. But if you look at the map of Washington or Oregon, just take these two states, by and large, the wind blows hardest where the people are not. <laughs> when George W. Bush was president, his energy department said enough wind blows between the North Dakota border with Canada and the West Texas border with Mexico to electrify America many times over. But by and large, the wind blows where the people are not. The sun shines more uniformly, but more often, in certain places, which you all know, many of them outside of Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, and California, and Florida are in less populated areas. But New Jersey has the second highest number of solar panels in America, and they're working for them. Now you just think how many jobs we could create building a modern electronic system where we connected the grids in a more efficient way and where we can send this energy everywhere. It can't be done anywhere else. Don't stop here, here. Send the revolution of the end. Second, 
second big opportunity we have is to bring advanced manufacturing back to America. Yeah. Yeah. Now, let me explain that. People always look at me when I say this, but I have some, I hope, credentials here. When I was young, and I came up here asking you to vote for me in 1992, our state was one of eight that had gained manufacturing jobs in the 80s. In the 90s, we gained manufacturing jobs, and I was president in six of the eight years I served. But we worked hard at it. And there's not just one big silver bullet. We have now gotten back after losing millions in the crash. 900,000 manufacturing jobs have come back to America. Why do I say we can get more? Because it's the most productive part of every economy. Look at all the places. I bet you there are tons of places in Washington where you have these 3D printers and children not even out of elementary school can work them better than I can understand them. Yeah. Right? People are building housing developments with them around the world. Now what does that mean? It means that labor is ever a smaller and smaller and smaller part of the cost of production. And materials, energy, and transportation are a higher cost. Since we got the biggest market in the world, we should save the transportation cost and bring a lot of those jobs back home to the United States. And this is one area where there's a big difference between Hillary and her opponent. We have only 4 or 5% of the world's population. If you want 20% of the world's income, you have to sell something to somebody else. That's why it's very important in Washington you've got at least 85,000 jobs directly affected by the Export-Import Bank, which most Americans have never heard of. First of all, it doesn't cost you anything. You make a profit out of it. But what it does is it enables American companies that export to compete on equal terms with countries like us. Every one of them has government support to finance their exports just to get them there at the cheapest possible cost. That's all the XM Bank does. It facilitates getting whatever people are buying to the point of sale at a competitive cost. And then when our companies are paid, including the 162 small businesses in Washington who use it, they turn around and pay back the government with interest. That's why it doesn't cost you anything. Hillary thinks it's important and supports every other Democrat in the Senate, except for opponent, in expanding the XM Bank. And he disagrees with her. He says we shouldn't do it because he thinks Boeing gets too much of it. But it's not Boeing. It's 81,000 jobs of people who make good wages, have good health care, have good retirement, and still have good income. It's an honest difference of opinion, but I think you can be against trade bills that don't work. For example, it's very difficult for us to make trade agreements with Asian countries because they are culturally averse to buying other people's products unless they absolutely have to have them, and because they can manipulate their currency if they're not democratic governments. And China's the biggest offender there, but it's, it's a problem. And a lot of us who beat our heads against the wall for years have found that. But you can't be against trade, especially when we're winning. <laughs> and we're helping other countries by giving them products which enable them to grow their own economies. That's a good thing. They have more money, they can buy more stuff. This is a big difference. It's very important that we have an economic policy that will maximize our job opportunities and our income opportunities. The other thing we got a real shot to do is revive small business growth in this country. Yeah. Don't forget this. Two thirds of all the jobs created in America in the last 20 years have been created by small businesses. And when I was president, we loaned more money, especially to women and minority business owners, than had been loaned in the entire 40-year history of the SBA. And we also began to enforce something called the Community Reinvestment Act, which is a simple law that was never enforced. It said, I don't care how big your bank is, you've got to loan some money in every community where you have investors. 
You have to make loans in this community. Small business loans, agricultural loans, loans for new entrepreneurs, loans for young people with a new tech idea that they don't want to sell it to a venture capitalist and have to give up half the business to get it. $800 billion was loaned into that when I served. And we were in the top five in the world in small business formation. We're not in the top ten anymore. And it's because of a good thing that the president did. And I'll explain. He signed something called the Dodd-Frank Law. It is a great law. It makes, I don't care what anybody else tells you, in this election or any other one, it's better than anything we had for 50 years before. And it's designed to prevent Wall Street from ever wrecking Main Street again. Because what did they do? What did they do? After I left office, all the growth before the crash was in consumer spending, home building, and finance. So what happens? All the money percolates up to the top, and then rich people don't invest it back down. They start gambling with it. And when the gambling comes to an end and the music stops, you get hit with the wreckage. That's essentially what happened. It was a failure of government. There has never been a time in history, as far as I know, when people who had lots of unaccountable money weren't always trying to get more of it. We had systems that should have stopped it and didn't. This system allows the administration to break up any bank that insists on gambling with your future without adequate capital to back it up. extend to non-banks like hedge funds and billionaires who are doing the same thing today. Hillary wants to take them in and make them live by the same rules. The law says that it explicitly exempts community banks worth less than $10 billion and community lending. But a lot of people are so scared of what happened before that they've extended the rules down and it's costing banks too much money to process small business loans. Think about here. Suppose somebody wants to borrow 80,000 bucks to start a bakery. If it costs the same amount of money for the bank to process an $80,000 loan as it does an $80 million loan, there won't be as many $80,000 loans. She has committed to make sure we change the law and the regulatory practice so that people loan money where they take deposits in their country. There are still barriers that keep some people from participating. We got to get the incomes up. I support this initiative in Washington to raise the minimum wage and to have paid sick leave. We also should have paid family leave and equal pay. That would be right. deal with this college debt problem. Yeah. Look, when I was president, we gave aid to 10 million more people. Yeah. I met a woman this morning, introduced me to her daughter, and said, I got a degree because of that college aid program you passed. <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of it was taken away after I left. Then President Obama got back in. When the Democrats had Congress, they passed a bigger aid program. But the cost of college kept going up, especially in states where legislators, mostly Republican, had less money after the crash. They wanted to give tax cuts. They had to fund the public schools, so they started underfunding the public colleges. So the colleges started behaving like private colleges and raising tuition. And that meant more and more young people wound up borrowing money, not from the good federal programs, but outside that system. So they got regular bank loans and high interest rates they couldn't repay. So here's what Hillary proposed. We should have a system where every young person can graduate completely debt-free from any public institution of higher education in this country. If you're middle class or below, you can get free tuition. And if you're lower income, you can get more help. She wants a big increase in the Pell Grant so we can pay for supplies, living expenses, to help people get it for their lives. Yeah. 
She wants everybody to be able to work 10 hours a week on a work study grant, which will hold down college costs, not increase it. That won't kill anybody, it'll give them more money, and it will really help to it'll be the first thing we've done in a long time to hold down college costs. She believes that upper income people should pay their kids and their grandkids on tuition. Not that we shouldn't raise taxes on them, upper income people, but we should use that money to put the rest of the country to work, to create good middle class jobs for private income. For the people that already have debt, this may be the most important thing of all. People that already have debt from any source. She thinks they should be able to consolidate their loans and first, if they're at a high interest rate, refinance them. Did you know that college loans are the only loans in America you can't refinance? Yeah. Right before I came on this trip, I went to a little town next to the one where Hillary and I live in New York and went with, to see a, a lady I always trade with. I bought a pair of jeans. And I said, uh, I knew she had a son, she was real proud of him. I said, your son out of college yet? She said, yeah, he just graduated, he's a good student. He doesn't have a job yet, but he'll get one, and he will. The unemployment rate's two and a half percent for people with a four-year degree. I said, does he have a college debt? She said, quite a bit. What's the interest rate? Nine percent. I said, do you still have a home mortgage? She said, yeah. I said, did you refinance it? She said, sure I did. What's your interest rate? Under four. If you let every student in this country with a debt refinance it at current interest rates tomorrow, overnight, 25 million young Americans will save an average of $2,000 a week. like instrument that you pay out over 20 years because make no mistake about it every bit as much as a house a degree is a lifetime asset yes, and you'll always have it and let people pay it back as a small percentage of their after-tax income no matter how much they borrow they can never be required to pay more than 10 percent of their after-tax income <laughs> That means everybody can move out of their parents' house. It means that if someone has a job they don't really like just to pay the bills, and there's a job over here they love, but it pays less, they can take it because their own repayment will go down. It means that after 20 years, the rest of it's forgiven. It means if you want to get rid of it earlier, if you do two years in an AmeriCorps program, and then a year of any kind of public service, teacher, nurse, social worker, police officer, firefighter, you can earn $23,000 tax-free, and that will get rid of 90% of the loans in the country altogether. There's no more barriers to seizing the opportunities. The other thing we've got to do is finish the work of health reform. Look, when all the Republican governors finally figured out that this is good economics, they'll join the Medicaid expansion program. The governor of Wyoming right now, I'm going to Wyoming tomorrow because they're having a talk to The governor of Wyoming, the Republican governor, is trying to convince the legislature to take the Medicaid expansion. Because in every state that's done, more people have gone to work, it's generated more tax revenues, and it has humanized life for literally millions of working families who work but have modest incomes. Once you do that, you'll be at about 95%. Easy to get to 100. And we need to look at the real problems. The real problems are the drug prices are still too high. We've got to price these drugs down. We've got to do what I think we can do. In other places, every, we're the only place in the world that doesn't have some volume discounts for people in healthcare programs like this. Second thing we have to do is to reorganize the health insurance market for the individual and small business insurance. There aren't enough insurers, it's not properly organized, and the copays and deductibles are too high. But the third and by far the most important thing we should do 
is to get every single American enrolled in a plan where you pay a flat fee instead of playing by procedures. If every time you do that and you pay and reward plans for keeping you healthy, so they make more money when they have to spend less, and then when somebody really needs it, because keep in mind, 20% of the people account for 80% of the medical costs every year. It's just a shifting 20%. When you do that, every single place in America this has been done. The quality of people's health has gone up and the cost has gone down. Yeah. That's what she wants to do. a couple because I think they're worth mentioning. We need prison reform. We got too many young people in prison. But as Hillary has said, there's no point in letting people out of jail if they've been there, if they're just going to be turned down for every job and they have no skills. We need to spend some transition money to make sure they have education, training, job placement, and don't face discrimination when they apply for a job because they're in jail. extra for the places that have been left out and left behind. I mean, really significant. And that includes Indian country. The poorest Americans are still Native Americans who live on reservations without gambling. And still the poorest Americans. And yet, west of the Mississippi, virtually every single tribal land is a gold mine waiting to explode in their capacity to generate clean energy. They could use the revenues to diversify their economy. Then, if our infrastructure program works right, we will make every small town in rural America accessible to affordable, rapid broadband, and overnight, they will be in the whole American economy. And we're going to hold it for the in coal country, the same thing for the Mississippi Delta, the same thing for every distressed area in the United States. We should give people a big tax credit, not for moving jobs overseas, but for investing in areas in America that have been left down and left behind. Just a couple of other things. We've got to do something about immigration reform. We need immigration reform. Hillary is committed to take care of these young dreamers and not to send them back. It would be a terrible mistake. You know, when these guys in the other party talk about sending 11.5 million people home, they're playing to people who feel that they've been deprived. Almost 100% of them live in areas where you can't identify a single job that they lost because of an immigrant. The immigrants are out there working, paying taxes, and doing a good job. And if they're worried about it, they're worried about it. And we should get them to come up and say this is true. Nobody favors letting anybody jump the line. So if immigrants fully documented came here to apply for citizenship, they are in line, and nobody proposes losing their place in line. But the idea that we're going to make a look at this crowd. Do you think this crowd would have been this diverse 30 years ago? Well, it might have been here because of the influ and early influx of Asians to this part of our country. But most crowds I address are far, far, far more diverse today than they would have been 30 years ago. And if we were having, if we were having a political rally in most places in America 30 years ago, the crowd would look disproportionately like me. <laughs> Old gray-haired white guys and suits. And you know, looking around here, I'm very thankful that my demographic has not been entirely eliminated. I thank you. <laughs> Having lost it, I can tell you, youth matters. You talk to any serious economist, and they will tell you that the fact that we are the youngest advanced economy on earth and the most diverse almost guarantees us the brightest future. 
We don't want to mess with this. Let's fix it. Let's stop fighting over immigration, have a sensible immigration reform, take care of these kids, and get the families to If we are going to have shared prosperity, we have to live in an inclusive community. We have to relish our diversity. And we have to be able to govern together and work together. That starts with having a Supreme Court that doesn't play politics with the right to vote. We need to do what Oregon's done, what Washington's done. We need to make it easier for people to vote. that will reconsider the Citizens United case that hung up for sale sign on the door of our democracy. <laughs> Look, we got to do this together. And the last thing I will say is this. I think that you should vote for Hillary, yes, because I think she got the best ideas. Yes, and also because every economist who's looked at all the candidates in both parties, and I'm talking about the liberal economists, like the Nobel Prize winning progressive economist for the New York Times, Paul Krugman, they've all said that she's the only candidate we've got whose numbers add up. And believe me, if you're a progressive and you want to do things with government, the first way they kill you is saying you're making promises that you can't keep. She's an old-fashioned girl. She believes in arithmetic. <laughs> the second reason is, obviously, that this time is different from when I won. When you elected me, I ran on income inequality. I ran on rebuilding the middle class and giving poor people a chance to work their way into it. And it worked pretty well. It's the only time I think we've ever had the incomes of the bottom 20% in percentage terms increasing more than the incomes of the top 20%. And, and, and 95% of American people had higher income gains than they did under President Reagan. And of course, then trickle down economics ran out and they went down in the both bushes. So we can do this. But I was the first president at the end of the Cold War after the Berlin Wall fell, when everybody knew we were the only military, economic, and political superpower. And I could go in and build a coalition to stop the slaughter in Bosnia, to prevent the genocide that would have happened in Kosovo. <laughs> All I'm saying is, it was easier for me to put things together. So it was easier for America to grow unencumbered by bad stuff happening around the world. The European Union was coming together. China was trying to be more responsible in reaching out to us. Russia was still a democratic country that wanted to be part of Europe. It's very different. The Middle East is in trouble. Russia threatens Europe's eastern flank, and Ukraine in particular. The European Union is threatened with breaking apart with their own version of ultranationalism, getting more votes in Central Europe, which the United States works so long to liberate. And they're overburdened with all these refugees from Syria, the largest refugee crisis since the end of World War II. You cannot afford not to have a president who can also be commander in chief. And it's not just a military job. Hillary was on the Armed Services Committee. The Pentagon asked her to be on a special committee to plan the military of the 21st century and this committee recommended exactly what President Obama is doing in ISIS land. No more big land wars in the Middle East. Send in the special forces to help people to the fight for themselves. It's important.
important, it's important that we take care of the veterans. We're still not finished doing everything we need to do for people with traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress syndrome. We've got people who lived when they would have died in previous wars, but they have lost limbs. They need constant therapy and development, and she will do that. She is committed to that. But, but you also got to have a tough diplomacy. And you have to realize that in a world where you can't possibly kill, jail, or occupy all your enemies, when that horrible mess in San Bernardino happened because the terrorists were converted over the internet, you can build all the walls you want, and you cannot keep the social media out. Yeah. So I am especially proud that my candidate for president this morning spoke to the American Israeli Political Action Committee and reaffirmed our ties to Israel, but was the first and most outspoken opponent of demonizing Muslims and saying they couldn't come here because of their religion. responsibility for implementing the recommendations 
of the panel to improve security. End of story. So that wasn't good enough, so they impaneled a special committee and said, look, the other guys didn't get the memo. This is not about what really happened, this is about what we're trying to inform you. And he said on television, on Fox News, that the most important achievement of the Republican Congress in the last year was driving down our poll numbers because they had a seventh committee. And they had an 11th hour hearing. And I don't know about you, but I thought she ate their lunch in the morning. <laughs> Republicans, it was because they were committed to doing something that undermined the very fiber of this country. Decency and unity and honesty in the conduct of our foreign policy. But they were just trying to do it, and it worked to some extent, and they're good at it. They've been doing it a long time. Delegitimizing people, but believe me, if you nominate her, you'll get a chance to hear what all those people said about her before they started worrying about her running for president. <laughs> and then you'll have to ask yourself whether you're telling the truth then or telling the truth then. <laughs> when, when, when we lost on health care, she didn't quit. She went to work and worked with Senator Kennedy and created the Children's Health Insurance Program. We put it in the Balanced Budget Act so three quarters of the Republicans voted for it. And guess what? There are 8 million people insured under that program. It's an integral part of the Affordable Care Act today. She has kept her work. And one of the other things she did was to go to the member of Congress that disliked me the most, the Republican leader, Tom DeLay of Texas. And she said, Congressman, I know we don't agree on much. He said, Hillary, do we agree on anything? She said, you love your children, don't you? He said, what's that going to do? She said, look, Congressman, no matter how much we disagree, I know you adopted those kids, and I honor you for it. But she said, the foster homes of America are exploding with children, and they're about to have huge numbers age out of adoption, age out of foster care, with no education, no ability to get a job, no money to find a place to live. We're just going to turn them out. We can't let it happen. She said, here's why it's happening. Too many people are really afraid to adopt non-infant children for reasons that are obvious. And even more are afraid to adopt children with special needs. So let's write a bill with those tax credits you Republicans like so much. Let's give people a weapon tax credit if they adopt a child who's not an infant. And a bigger one if they adopt a child with special needs. And let's give them other supports. Let's just do that. All I had to do was sign the bill. And when I left office, adoptions out of foster care had increased by 80%. She had always had a second bill. In addition to getting $20 million for New York to help the people put their lives back together again and working with the White House to get it, when Katrina hit, you remember it hit the Gulf Coast, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and East Texas. All red states, right? The Republican Senate leader then, Trent Lott of Mississippi, with a choking voice said in public that no member of Congress of either party in either house had done more to help the people of his area outside who lived outside the Gulf Coast than Hillary. And she said, we're all Americans when something like this happened. You guys helped us rebuild New York, and I wanted to make sure we did the right thing by you. That's a good moment. Upstate New York is like a lot of areas of rural Washington. It's pretty rural. It's pretty Republican. Agriculture. A lot of gun clubs, a lot of hunters. <laughs> and nobody was doing anything to help them. So she helped wine growers sell their wine in restaurants in New York City for the first time. She helped small manufacturers get on the internet so they could do business around the world. She helped 
farmers on Long Island sell their produce locally and preserve it and get better prices for the first time ever. So when she ran for re-election, the head of the Farm Bureau on Long Island announced that he would support her. So the press rushes to him, you know, and they said, I thought you were a Republican. He said, I am. He said, well, how can you be for her? He said, look, all these politicians, they sound real good at election time. She is the only person who ever actually did anything to help the family from the When she became Secretary of State, she negotiated a treaty, her team did, with Russia to reduce the risk of accidental or intentional nuclear war. Important. Those things take 67 votes in the Senate to be ratified. It's a lot of Republicans. She got them. She did the Iran sanctions and got China and Russia to go along, and they all thought it was great, even the ones that didn't agree with the ultimate deal. She did thing after thing like that. And she did something else that I think is important. When she was Secretary of State, she assumed the running of the PEPFOR program. I don't know if you know what that is, but you pay for it. And I think it's the best thing George Bush did. It spends your money to help keep people alive in poor countries with AIDS, TB, and malaria. And so she did what she now wants to do for you. She decided all those AIDS drugs should be FDA-approved generic drugs because they were so much cheaper. So it didn't cost you one penny more. But when she took office, your money was saving 1.7 million lives overseas. And when she left, it was saving 5.1 million lives overseas. And you don't know. You don't know any of those people, but they know you. And it makes a difference. You know, we have huge problems with nascent terrorism threatening the African continent, Boko Haram in Nigeria. Al Shabaab in Somalia and Kenya. And of course, Al Qaeda affiliates or ISIS affiliates always know that around. Ansar Dean in Bali. So, one of the places that Al Qaeda tried to make itself felt when I was president, you will remember, you remember when they blew up American embassies and attacked them in, in Kenya and Tanzania next door? Well, so here's the story. Tanzania is about evenly divided between Christians and Muslims, and then people who follow African animist faith. They had that terrible incident. I spent a lot of time working there myself with our foundation. But one day, about two weeks ago, I got this amazing picture on my iPad to start the day. There's a guy with a little store, he called it a store, on the street in the capital of Tanzania, Dar es Salaam, with a lot of, you know, basically just crafts on a rack you can turn around. But on the rack it's got a sign that says, the Hillary Clinton store. <laughs> now, why is that important? Because you may not know those 3.4 million people who are alive, but they and their relatives know you. And they know she cares about them. One of her young workers was a Turkish American working six miles from the mile border in New Hampshire, talking about giving a guy a tough dude. And he said, I just want you to know why I'm doing this. I spent my life in South Sudan, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in all these troubled places. I didn't wear a uniform. I worked for a non-government organization. I was trying to help kids stay alive. And every place I went, they said she was the first Secretary of State that ever understood the value of this, that we had to make more friends and fewer enemies if we were going to keep America safe in the 21st century. I want to begin when I began. She knew the best for the economy. She knew the best for tearing down the barriers and finishing the unfinished work in health care and in education reform. She is qualified today to deal with these very hard questions in a world far more hostile than the world I encountered 
when I took the oath of office in 1993. I believe in terms of fitting the times in which we need a president, she's the best qualified person I've ever had a chance to vote for. So I will say again, look for everybody you can drag, kicking and screaming to the caucus. <laughs> look for everybody who is eligible to cast a provisional ballot and make sure they've got one and they use it. And somebody say, as many as it is possible, I will stand up in one of these caucus sites and say in three minutes why she ought to be the next president. And if you do, she can be, and we can all rise together. Thank you.